of course, I follow what international investors do, and then I tend to do the opposite. So for the last 18 months, I had to hear the nonsense of how great America is doing and that America would outperform everything else when, in fact, over the last two years, there were many markets that have significantly outperformed the U.S. Last year, Brazil was up 66% in dollar terms. Russia was up close to 60% in dollar terms. And Kazakhstan, 60% in dollar terms. Thailand, 20%. The Philippines, also around 22%, and so forth and so on. So, yeah, I follow what the international investors do. And then I avoid doing the same nonsense. And recently, there was again this huge euphoria about the U.S. and how great Trump would make America again. I haven't seen the results yet. But the fact is, since the beginning of the year, the Indian index in dollar terms is up 8%. The S&P is up 2.5%. Uh, many markets in Asia are up 8 9%. Singapore is up 9%. Thailand, 6%. In Asia, just about every market has outperformed the U.S., but the U.S. fund managers tell you how great the America is and that one should overweight the U.S. and neglect the emerging markets. And I think, and I maintain what I said on this program before, that over the next 10 years, by investing in India and in emerging economies, you will outperform the U.S. by a wide margin, wide margin. Right. Uh, Mark, uh, President Trump has been making multiple announcements uh, for various uh, things, political uncertainty, protectionism, and of course, he's not kept up the pharmaceutical space uh, with regard to drug pricing, and of course, uh, H-1B visa concerns as well. Should investors be worried about uh, all that Trump is seeing? And keeping that in mind, how do you approach Indian IT and pharma stocks? Well, that uh, will depend on how uh, Mr. Trump and his team implements its uh, protectionist rhetoric. Uh, they talk uh, big and uh, they talk a lot, <laughs> especially through Twitter, and we'll see what the actions are because you have to also understand the U.S. goes and then uh, it says Mexico has taken advantage of the U.S. as an example, or China has taken advantage of the U.S. But that is simply not quite true. And uh, there is another dimension to these protectionist measures. The U.S. basically does not want to retreat entirely from the world scene. They want to have a say in the South China Sea. They want to meddle in Europe. They want to meddle in Latin America, and so forth and so on. If you really implement protectionist policies, you will uh, alienate the countries that actually you want to use or to boost as a bulwark against China. So it would be very unwise if you wanted to hurt China to try to weaken India and its industries, you understand? Or if you try to weaken Vietnam, which has also large trade surplus with the US. So I think that actually in the end, reason will prevail and uh, that some people in the administration will actually tell Mr. Trump that if anybody did benefit from globalization over the last uh, 25 years or so, it was actually the U.S. and the U.S. corporate sector. Right. So then uh, looking at this uh, setup, uh, Mark, how should you read dollar movement, especially with regards to commodities as also Asian currencies in particular? 
Well, basically, I think that uh, in the course of 2016, most commodities bottomed out, and some have had huge rallies. Zinc, lead, iron ore, sugar, they're all up approximately 100% from the lows. Oil was at $32, and we went to close to $60. So I think that commodities probably bottomed out. And uh, my view would be that especially agricultural commodities will perform quite well this year. I also believe that in this environment of eternal money printing, and they may stop for a while, you know, maybe in Europe or maybe in Japan, or reduce the asset purchases, but basically, the governments in the Western world are bankrupt, and the only way to postpone the truce and uh, the democratic governments, they have to keep the illusion going that pensioners will get the pensions and people who are on Social Security, they will get the Social Security. So I think that the money printing will go on and that this will in time, boost precious metal prices. Right. Uh, Mark, uh, for our viewers' sake, uh, which are the sectors you prefer currently uh, when you look at India or even globally, actually? I'll give you what I invest in emerging markets at the present time, and this would also apply to India. These are banks, insurance companies, leasing companies, agriculture, food, beverages, mining, and real estate. And within the real estate, my favorite are companies related to logistic. Right. Uh, Mark, uh, China recently announced some capital market reforms uh, as well. Has that changed the sentiment as far as emerging market allocations are concerned? And is it really a cause of concern for markets like India, considering that some of those flows that are meant, to, meant for India may now go to China? Yes, I think that in general, there has been a very negative view towards the Chinese economy and towards Chinese stocks. Now, I'm not sure about the economy, and precisely people don't know whether we will have a crash in the economy, because we have, the fact is we have a credit bubble. But you understand, the credit bubble is of course also offset by a huge pool of savings. So exactly how it will play out, I don't know. My sense is uh, it's almost written in stone that the economy will slow down to a long-term growth rate of, say, 4 percent. But, you know, compared to Europe and to Japan and to the U.S., 4 percent is not so bad. And compared to the size of the Chinese economy, because the Chinese economy is today essentially uh, in the manufacturing sector, certainly the largest economy in the world. So 4% would actually be a good growth rate. But the sentiment, as I mentioned to you by international investors, has been very bearish about emerging markets, including, of course, India and China, and very positive about the US. And I explained to you before that I would overweight emerging markets, and uh, I have started to take some positions in China. Not a lot yet, but I think that uh, Chinese stocks could actually surprise on the upside, as I believe that, say, uh, Mexican investments and Turkish investments this year could outperform other markets.
Mark, uh, talking about uh, somewhat domestic cues, in fact, it's the big event here in India tomorrow where the Reserve Bank of India will meet uh, for its big anticipated policy move. One, uh, what are you expecting from the RBI given the fact that the government's borrowing stands at a 12-year low from what we heard of the budget? Uh, do you think a rate cut is the need of the hour to boost domestic uh, growth and economy back here? Well, I think that interest rates are important, but I would say the most important for India, whether it's for big uh, companies, small enterprises, individuals, is stability of the currency. And if the rupee it can be stable and under relatively high real rates, the rupee is going to be relatively stable. As you've seen in the last few weeks, the rupee has strengthened against the US dollar. So that is a very good sign. And if I were the policymakers in India, I would aim at currency stability rather than, say, trying to boost economic activity with artificial low interest rates. Because if we look at, say, the experience of Japan, of Europe and the U.S., low interest rates have had a very beneficial impact on asset prices. But as you know, assets in a country like India or the U.S., and I'm not singling India out, but say maybe 90 percent of assets stocks, real estate, bonds, and uh, companies are owned by maybe 10% of the people. So the artificially low interest rates helps a small portion of the population, not the majority of the people. And therefore, I, as you know, I very, question, I very much question the validity of the Keynesian series as of today, maybe at the time of Keynes, there was some merit to boost government spending, but it went too far and the governments became too big and so forth. So as of today, I don't think that monetary policies and fiscal policies are very effective any longer. I think uh, more effective would be measures that would boost the growth rate of uh, the private sector, which would include a more efficient legal commercial infrastructure and far less regulation. Regulation and market manipulation, like mark moving interest rates up and down and targeting the exchange rate and so forth, these manipulations, they destroy the free market and are gross restraining, gross retarding.